Chairman uh, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here and delighted to welcome you on behalf of ESB to the third lecture in the 2014 ESB Power to the People lecture series. As Tom says, we belong and um, proud uh, relationship with the institution. And um, this series of lectures provides a very important forum for generating debate and advancing thinking on the complex challenges facing the energy sector today and how we can work together. And I believe it's really, really important that we do work together on resolving them. And I'm very pleased to uh, have the opportunity to address you today. I'm pleased also to have Eamon Ryan here, former minister, um, because Eamon and I, uh, we challenge each other on these kind of issues and the issues I'm going to raise. And the one thing I'd be really interested in here is having a good old debate about it, so I might have less to say rather than more in the interest of maybe uh, promoting a bit of a debate. Um, I, I happen to have the privilege of um, being chief executive of ESB. I've spent 30 plus years in ESB and um, I'm very proud of the company and very proud of its heritage and its contribution to the development of, of the energy system and, and our Irish society and the economy in Ireland. Um, ESB is a 10 billion plus assets of uh, in public ownership. Um, we have undergone, got, undergone a huge transformation from being an incumbent monopoly uh, generator, transmitter, distributor of electricity for, I suppose, over, over 60 years uh, to with increasing competition regulation now to a point where we are a player, one of many players uh, in the Irish and indeed the European energy sector. Um, <clears throat> What I'd just like to talk about today <coughs> is um, just maybe some challenges for European energy policy and how they, you know, they, they are the same challenges, similar challenges for Irish energy policy. And it's particularly relevant given that um, we have, uh, I see Ken Spratt here, um, uh, Assistant Secretary of the Department of Energy, Communication and Natural Resources, given that that department has just issued and the Minister has just launched a, a consultation, a green paper uh, on energy and energy policy. But the context of all of this, I suppose, is the EU ambition for a single European market, and I'd like to come back to that point maybe um, uh, during, um, you know, over the course of what I'm going to say. Uh, of course, everybody knows that uh, electricity is an essential service. People expect it when they turn on the light switch on the wall, the lights just come on. Um, it is a long cycle. It's characterised by being a long-life, capital-intensive business, and that's really, really important. Uh, you, you invest today... You know, people who invest in the energy and electricity sector today invest billions uh, to get a return on that investment over anything from 20 to 40 years. And you know, what I'm going to really the question I'm going to pose here is really how do you achieve that kind of investment? And there's a huge investment needed in this industry. How do you achieve that investment in the context of markets and the role that markets and regulation will play in doing that? Um, uh, electricity, of course, is is a huge enabler of societal well-being and, of course, of the economy, um, and it is, it is an essential service. But the future we're facing in the energy sector is more complex and uncertain than it ever has been. Um, the way electricity is produced, transported and consumed is changing quite dramatically, and it's driven predominantly by technology, technology, market regulation policies, um, and, of course, in the last 10 or so years, the need to decarbonise uh, our electricity system to address the global challenge of climate change. Um, you know, traditionally, and for many, many years, the, you know, for like the electricity industry is over 100 years old, but for most of that, it's been characterised by very large-scale centralised generation plant feeding into a transmission system and then a, a radial, what we call a radial distribution network, bringing uh, power uh, electricity to customers. And long term, those long term decisions that were, that were necessary uh, about capital intensive projects could be made in an environment of relative certainty in terms of the return on that investment. Uh, and that's, that was kind of up to maybe 20, 25 years ago. That was how the electricity uh, industry was characterised. But in, from about 1990 onwards, and driven mainly by the UK, European energy policy focused exclusively on costs and lower prices. So it was an efficiency driver from about 1990 onwards. And the UK, as I said, led this way by adopting a market-based approach to managing generation and introducing an independent regulator into that piece of the value chain that has accepted that the network's piece of the value chain is a natural monopoly. So you know, on the back of uh, you know, UK policy, 
competition and generation, competition and retailer supply and regulation of the, of the worst component of it. And the rest of Europe followed. And I think the UK today is really interesting. From having started the cycle 25 years ago, what's happening today in Great Britain, the UK government is actually on the cusp of driving some very, very significant thinking around the evolution of markets and regulation in the last 25 years on the back of unique problems that exist in um, the UK in terms of affordability, in terms of decarbonisation and in terms of security of supply, the trilemma that Tom spoke about. Um, and you know, this system that has been in place uh, since the 1990s worked well on the network side. Uh, the regulatory model provided certainty for the necessary investment in network assets and it provided an environment where uh, network asset owners were achieving um, adequate returns. And the emergence then of combined cycle gas generation technology, particularly gas te CCGT technology, is relatively fast build, relatively fast payback. And that's an important concept in terms of markets. Um, then it kind of standardised the new generation fleet right across Europe, and it effectively made electricity a commodity at the wholesale level, which is one of the desires or the ambitions of the creators of energy markets. But around 2005, or the, the, the dynamic was changing, but in 2005 uh, was a critical changing point, I believe. Um, the, the kind of the well-recognised dilemma of cost and security supply took on a third component, which was the climate change component. And that, that was kind of evidenced by the, um, the, 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 the 2020, the EU third energy package, uh, the, the 20, what's, what's called the 2020 20, uh, uh, package, which made sustainability a key part of energy policy. So it added that third leg um, to, to security of supply and cost. And EU, EU leaders signed up to binding commitments to achieve a 20% reduction in greenhouse gases from 1990 levels, to raise the share of energy consumption from renewables to 20% and to deliver 20% improvement in energy efficiency. And it is clear that there have been some conflicting um, elements to those policies. Like a key driver of the generation piece of that was the creation of a carbon market, but the carbon market has failed. And the, the way in which the carbon market collides with renewable targets and renewable targets were allowed to be set on, at national level so individual countries across Europe could set their own renewables targets and that had an impact on how that collided with the carbon market and the effect now that there's a new package has come from the energy, uh, a 2030 package has come from the uh, EU Commission uh, which looks at a 40% reduction in greenhouse gas right across Europe uh, on a pan-European basis and renewables targets of 27% set on a, on a pan-European basis but not clear what the in-country component of that is going to be. And that piece of how that policy is implemented will be a key driver of the energy system and investments in the energy system in the period beyond 2020. And what we need is certainty in, in that particular regard, but we need certainty beyond 2020. If the desire of Europe is to decarbonise electricity industry or an 80% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2050, we need certainty, investment certainty beyond the, 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 that 2030 horizon. And it's back to that long cycle capital investment um, uh, kind of characteristic of the electricity system that I mentioned. We will, invest, we, in, we will invest in technologies today and are investing, as all developers and all generators are in technology today, that will be around in 2050 or 2060. So we need certainty to actually backstop that in, in investment. Um, but, you know, again, the electricity system right across Europe and Ireland was no different in this regard, uh, was identified as a primary vehicle to achieve these 2020-20 targets. Um, and that, on the basis that if you decarbonise electricity, you can actually decarbonise the economy. Um, and it completely changed the dynamic of the industry. So, and, and where we're heading now is away from that large-scale centralised uh, generation system to a very, very different type of... Um, so instead of the, that centralised generation feeding to broadly passive consumers, uh, we are heading now for a combination of centralised, large-scale centralised generation and distributed generation and distributed storage. But we talk of customers now instead of consumers, and customers in the future will be producers. So we will have people right out at the end of the electricity system who will be producing their own electricity but also buying, buying electricity. And this presents a huge challenge for a wholly market-based system. Uh, markets work best when their only job is to match up supply and demand 
for commoditized products at the appropriate cost. Markets are not so good when they're required to deliver a wide range of outcomes now required by policymakers in a political system which changes every five years. So again, a long cycle capital intensive industry that has a 20 to, five, 20 to 40 year investment cycle, but a policy system and a political system where EU commissions and governments change on a five year basis is a, is a key consideration in terms of future energy policy. Uh, the regulatory models for networks by and large have remained um, unchanged despite there's been massive investment in networks. And um, to, to support the, a, different, uh, a different kind of mix of generation, particularly in terms of renewables and in terms of the huge data now that is now needed that be generated by millions of customers who are going to, using smart technologies in the future, will be interacting proactively with the electricity system. Now, from a policy perspective, I believe then there are kind of, I suppose, there's, lot, there's many, many, many considerations, but it comes back to, I believe, three fundamental questions. Is the current regulatory model fit for purpose to deliver the scale of investment needed in networks? And is the market the best means of organising the generation sector? And the third piece then is, will the penetration of technology at the customer end fundamentally change the electricity value chain? Now, looking first at the regulatory framework, it's hard to see an alternative to the current model whereby an independent third-party regulator uh, regulates costs and outputs for network operators. Uh, we have five-year price control uh, periods here, uh, similar to uh, most other uh, regulated network asset owners. The regulator determines capital required to invest in the network and, and benchmarks and determines operating costs. And this effectively assure, ensures that customers pay an efficient cost for their network services. And the model has worked well here. Um, oh, it, oh, it has given reasonable stability in terms of network investment and ESB has invested about 7 billion in the electricity network over the past decade to a point where Ireland has one of the most advanced electricity networks uh, in Europe and probably indeed in the world. Um, but the task of regulators becoming much more complex as networks develop to meet the changing needs of the sector, particularly in terms of um, the huge investments needed to support um, the an energy system of the future characterised by different forms of generation, renewable generation, particularly intermittent generation and new smart technologies and more customer choice, particularly as customers now become both consumers and generators of electricity. Um, so the, the networks of the future will face very, very different challenges and they, they will have to develop, develop a whole range of services uh, that heretofore they didn't have to develop and this has implications for costs. And if you look at maybe a, a couple of scenarios that might materialise, traditional uh, networks have been monopoly services, but networks will compete in the future with alternative energy sources. For example, rooftop solar technologies um, is, 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 a, is a local distributed generation source. Um, and we, we, so what we, what we see, and we see this happening in the likes of Germany, where... Um, network, or sorry, distributed generation at the level of the household through, um, through, through solar technologies subvented by, by attractive government subventions then means that uh, investment in conventional generation is being stranded and that's required to support or to back up um, when, for example, the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow. Um, and what that means also for the networks business is that the... Um, effectively bypasses the networks business then, or the networks, the networks become more a backup service to customers who have their own generation, effectively bypassing, if you like, the, the networks. So what does that mean for society? Because the networks model, charging model, is a socialised charging model, so that if I have solar on my roof and somebody doesn't, then the charge I pay for an intermittent service provided by that network is effectively cross-subsidised by the customer who doesn't have solar, has all kinds of issues in terms of affordability and in terms of fuel poverty. Um, and and, and, and we, we see this now happening across the world where solar technologies, particularly solar technologies, are distributed, household distributed generation technologies are being deployed. If we look at the market... And I suppose the key question here is, can a market actually deliver the clean generation technologies needed uh, for, for the future? Um, and I suppose it depends on what you're trying to achieve in terms of outcomes. Market has delivered, it has delivered competitive uh, you know, outcomes and significant benefits for customers by driving efficiencies right across Europe. But efficiencies now are only one part of the picture. And the predominant trend in the last five or six years has been the return of state intervention. Um, so as more and more 
um, new technology, particularly technology to drive decarbonisation, come onto the power system, then you know, the role of markets um, and, 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 and traditional generation technologies and how they interact with uh, renewable technologies which are supported by government, uh, by government funding then, it, it creates unintended consequences in terms of you know, how can owners and investors in standby or backup technology or traditional technologies kind of compete with true market with uh, technologies that are effectively out of market in traditional cost terms but are needed to actually provide uh, clean technologies. So how can traditional technologies and generation compete with supportive technologies? And, and, and again, as I said, I gave the German example. We, we also see the example in Spain of what's called a tariff deficit where the Spanish government uh, drove huge penetration in renewables to a point where there was oversupply of renewables and existing standby, you know, existing fossil fuel plants which were required for standby were no not longer economically viable. The Spanish government pulled back on its renewable subsidies to a point where there's a huge deficit now that the Spanish government is kind of holding on to because to actually pass that deficit back on to customers would actually raise prices. Um, so markets are good, but they can't deliver everything. And uh, if we want to decarbonise the economy by 2050, we have to decarbonise the, the generation sector. But I don't believe there's any silver bullet to this. Uh, there's no single technology that is going to actually deliver a decarbonised electricity system by 2050. The answer is always is going to be a mix. The answer is going to be a mix of nuclear, of, of clean fossil fuel generation technologies. I believe that fossil fuel technology, generation technologies have a role to play in the future. They will become increasingly cleaner. And of course, new technologies in terms of renewables, in terms of solar, in terms of wind, and fuel cells, distributed storage. So there's a whole plethora and a whole host of technologies that are going to be required to deliver uh, the electricity system of the future. And what are, how is the market going to do this is a key question. While governments have to intervene to, you know, decarbonisation and climate change is a policy issue, so markets will not solve the decarbonisation issue. So how are governments going to intervene in such a way that it makes it feasible for investors in traditional technologies and technologies that are at market to coexist alongside technologies that are immature and not yet at market? And of course, the issue then about subsidies looms large in all of this. How can you know, subsidies do distort markets? And if the role of subsidies is to incubate new investments, then at what point do subsidies, you know, do subsidies fall away? We've an, we've an issue now today. You know, on, onshore wind today is probably competitive with traditional generation technologies, but it's still being subsidised. So subsidies should be seen as a way of incubating new technologies, but should be time-bound. Now, the third point I want to cover was the whole penetration of technology at the customer end, and the customer, the connected customer would play a huge role in decarbonisation. And this is all about the efficiency and the usage of, of, of end-use energy. Um, and it's, you know, it's interesting to look at what is, what, has, what is happening. Like Google and Microsoft some years ago entered into the home energy monitoring market but quickly exited. And Google recently have bought Nest Labs for $3.2 billion. And that's a clear indication now that Google actually see the customer end of the value chain as being... Um, an area that they're interested in. Uh, but what underpins this actually is the convergence of information, telecommunication, computing technologies with the traditional power system uh, technologies. Uh, I do believe that the customer, uh, you know, the customer has the potential supported by technologies such as smart metering to dramatically change the whole value chain uh, uh, of, of the electricity system. But you know, there are risks associated with this in terms of deploying this technology and how the technology is deployed. It has to be seen as more than just the replacement of traditional meters and traditional um, power system technologies. Uh, it's about, uh, about behaviour, it's about customer and behaviour, it's about how the customer actually interacts with their supplier and with their electricity system. Um, and, it, you know, it's, so, so smart metering is ultimately the enabler of a very, very different customer dynamic uh, in, 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 in terms of electricity system. And then the role that markets will play then at the retail end of the business, the retail end of the, uh, uh, the, retail end of, of, of the energy value chain is about, is about 10% of the total end user price. So what's the role that markets is going to play in a, play in a way that is cost effective and drives the behaviour change that is needed 
uh, to get customers play a very, very significant role in bringing about the kind of changes to our energy system. And I suppose the fundamental question here is, is the market going to actually drive customer behaviour? And what that means then, and there's deep implications for society, are we prepared to let price be the determinant of, 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 of customer behaviour? So, for example, are we prepared to let the price of electricity go to very, very high levels at peak to incentivise customers to change behaviour and move to maybe to cheaper times or lower, lower electricity, electricity consumption. This has huge societal implications. It has huge implications for policymakers, but that's at the pure end of the market. However, you know, what is likely to happen is that we will take a societal view of this and there will be interventions in the market then to lower those kind of implica- uh, the impacts, the negative impacts on customers, uh, particularly in terms of vulner- fuel vulnerability and fuel poverty. But then, of course, what does that mean then for market design? So again, the market, uh, back to that core question, where does the market sit and where does market design sit a long time gov- alongside government policies, alongside government incentives to, for things to be done by, by customers and by developers that are out of market? And how, how does the market actually change the way in which the power system is actually configured and actually works is a key policy issue. So I think you know, what's very, very striking about the, the environment that we find ourselves in today uh, in terms of energy policy is the scale of uncertainties, lo- like nothing I've seen in the last 30 years. Um, and it is, uh, as the chairman said at the opening, characterised by the need to, to balance three conflicting objectives, affordability, the need for secure supply, and the need to arrest climate change. This is the trilemma, as I said earlier, but we cannot have a policy environment where at different times we're focusing on different elements. So we cannot focus on different elements of that trilemma at different points in time in the cycle, whether it's a policy or a political cycle or an economic cycle. And what's really required is stable long-term policy, regulatory and a market environment. Um, and as you're aware, the Minister has launched a Green Paper, I said this earlier. Uh, it's an important document given the issues facing not only European but also Irish energy policy right now and the critical role that energy plays in the modern economy. It's a great opportunity for all of us, all stakeholders in this industry, to engage constructively in setting out a truly long-term vision, and more importantly, a roadmap, a roadmap on how we're going to transition to a clean, secure, and affordable energy future. Thank you.